I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Father, we wait for you because your timing is perfect and your character is good. So, Lord, we wait upon you and we also trust in your promises that those who wait upon the Lord shall have their strength renewed. So I pray for a renewal of strength in this place and in this church, that we would be a people of hope, a people with deep faith that does not trust in our circumstances, but we trust in the God of all circumstances. And so we trust you today With all of our cares, our worries, our burdens, we place them into the hands of our kind and loving Father in heaven who knows the number of hair on our heads, who knows the number of days that are left ahead of us. And so, all-knowing, all-loving, all-gracious God, we've gathered together in your name in your presence before your word and we ask speak Lord for your servants are listening and we we not just hear but God we want our lives transformed by the power of your word today so use me for your glory Father to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus and his name alone and in Jesus name we pray You know, I think one of the biggest fears uh, that many parents have is worrying about the problems and the pain that their children may face in life. Because this world can be a very cold and cruel place. And even as I encounter that reality more and more for my son Enoch, uh, I wish so much that I could protect Enoch from the pains and the evils of this world. You know, I was at a a kid's cafe just last week, uh, taking Enoch out so he could play. Um, And I am always surprised that when I encounter other children, uh, that sometimes you could see evil in their eyes. (laughs) I'm not used to that because I only look into Enoch's eyes every day. Um, And uh, there's this one uh, kid that was in the same kid's cafe, same age, And he would keep coming over to take whatever toy Enoch was playing with. And Enoch would get so angry and upset and saddened. And this kid kept doing it. And I kept looking for this kid's parents. They were nowhere to be found. And I kept having to try to teach and rebuke him in my very limited Korean, to which he did not understand. Um, And so uh, I was very guarding of Enoch. And so finally... As uh, it was dinner time and I was trying to feed him while he's playing around, he had his mouth full of food and then suddenly this kid comes back and he grabs the truck that Enoch was playing with and then Enoch's heart just broke and he started to cry and then his food started to spit out and started choking on the food and I had to get him water while I'm still trying to yell at this other kid for taking it away. It's like, you don't do that, give me back. And he's running away and so it's kind of chaotic. But uh, I was so saddened as I'm, again, trying to clean up the mess of his food, Enoch's food, trying to comfort him and trying to teach this kid a lesson all at the same time. And uh, it was hard. (laughs) um, But, you know, I'm so thankful that Enoch is not like that 
to other kids. He's very thoughtful. And so I was actually at the store with him about a month ago, and a similar episode happened where, uh, you know, he loves cars, and so he finds the toy section, and he was looking at a car, and another kid next to him grabs the toy out of his hands. But luckily, this kid's mom was right there, and so she uh, rebukes her kid and says, no, you don't grab things out of other people's hands. And so she takes it and put it, puts it back into Enoch's hands. And then Enoch, as he's observing the situation, he looks, and he finds another exact same toy, and he places it into the hands of this kid. Kind of like, you could have a toy too, you know? Uh, and I was so proud of Enoch. I was like, that's my son, you know? And I was like, not like these evil kids, you know? He's, he's a good kid, right? I was so proud of him. I was so, so happy that he was so considerate. But the reality is, is that we will all face uh, a lot of pain in this world, far worse than having toys taken out of our hands. And unfortunately, there will be harder days for Enoch coming as well. Days of suffering that he will need to live through. And as much as I wish that I could protect him from all the pain, I know that I can't. But what I can do is teach him how to hold on to Christ in the midst of it all. And that's probably one of the most important parental lessons we could ever teach our children, or the next generation, how to run to Christ when there's a crisis, how to turn to Christ when you are in tears, how to surrender to Christ when you are in suffering. One of the most important lessons we could ever pass down to the next generation. And you know, Peter is writing with the same heart to the suffering church and to the children of God in the churches that are experiencing deep pains and persecutions. He is writing with the heart of a parent longing for this child of God to be able to handle the pain that the world will come crushing down upon their lives with so that they turn to Christ, find strength, find hope, and maintain faith through it all. That is an important lesson for all of us to learn as well. And so he will teach us one more key perspective that we need to have when facing suffering in order to go through that period of pain properly as a people of faith, maintaining our faith. And so we want to look at that today. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 12 and following as we continue our journey through Peter's first letter. Follow along with me in your outlines as well. And so, how are we to see our suffering as a people of faith? And there's a few things that we're going to highlight for us today. First of all, when we do go through these difficult days, uh, what Peter teaches us today is that we must realize that suffering will happen. So everyone repeat, realize, suffering will happen. 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So Peter reminds us again that suffering will follow those who follow Christ. And I love how he begins this verse with, Beloved, people whom I love, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, people whom my heart longs for and cares for deeply. I do not say this as a cold-hearted leader to you that toughen up and face trials. It's a mean world out there. You know, bite your lip and just face it. He doesn't say it like that. He says, no, I say this out of love. He says, don't be surprised when the suffering happens in your lives. Because suffering will follow all those who follow Christ. The road to Calvary will come with its share of persecution, loss, and pain. So that's why he says, don't be surprised when, li when life gets hard. Why? Because this world is fallen because of sin. This world is broken because of sin. Our world is fallen and it is stained by the curse and the consequences of sin. That 
is why we have terrorist attacks in this world today. That is why we have virus outbreaks going on around the world. That is why we are angered by these injustices in this nation and around the world. Because our world is broken by sin. And all of creation is crying out to its creator. As Romans also says, all of creation is groaning and longing for the return of Christ so that Christ can come back and make all things right again. And we will suffer in this world because this world hates Jesus Christ. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, is what Jesus warns us. There will only be an increasing hatred from the world as we stand firm on the word of God, as we get closer to his return. What is happening in the Middle East, what is happening in the U.S. towards believers who state that Jesus is their Lord and that they follow his word, the opposition the mocking, the ridicule that is happening around the world, the persecution, and even the slaughter will only increase as the days get darker ahead of us. You will be hated if you love Jesus. Jesus warns us of that ahead of time. And maybe in previous generations, they will not have felt that hatred as strongly, but I can assure you, our generation and every generation that will follow us until the return of Christ, they will feel a stronger force of hatred by this world if we follow Christ. So make note of that ahead of time so that you are not surprised when suffering comes for following Jesus. So he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial, meaning intense pain, the fires of affliction into your life. Don't be surprised. And then he says, when it comes to test you. Every trial is a test. Every trial is a test of faith. That in this trial, will I still trust God, His character, His goodness, His sovereignty, His promises? It is a test to see what we value more, what we trust more, what we love more. Every trial is a test to see where our faith truly lies. Every trial is a test that reveals our faith, but also every trial is an opportunity to have our faith refined. When we choose to trust His character, His promise, our faith will be refined. But when we believe the lies and doubt His character, doubt His goodness, doubt His sovereignty, that faith will waver. So, beloved, my loved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. It is not a strange thing when suffering happens to those who follow Jesus, because if we bear his name, we will also share in his pain. You see, more than comfort, God is concerned with our character. And so when life gets difficult, that is an opportunity to be refined and have our faith matured and deepen its roots into God and his words. You see, he is doing something within us, not just around us, when pain enters our lives. When we walk into a new situation, when life crumbles around us and crises happen and suddenly our lives are falling apart and things are so different, God is not just doing something around us, God is seeking to do something within us. And that is to cultivate us, deepen faith, and to make us more like Christ. 
Amen. Jesus also told his disciples in John 16, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. So Jesus tells his disciples ahead of time, in this fallen, sin-stained, broken, crushed, crying world, you will have many trials, many hardships, many times of suffering, because this is not heaven. We are not home yet. But take heart, he says. Be of courage, because Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. Secondly, another thing he teaches us in this season of suffering is he says, we are to rejoice when you suffer for good. So everyone repeat, rejoice when you suffer for good. Verse 13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Strange, isn't it? I know some of you guys think, yeah, right. Come on, Peter, get real. Rejoice in our suffering. Come on. Who rejoices in suffering? Right? No one says, yes, pain, give me more. No one says, yes, more suffering, bring it on. Right? No one can rejoice in suffering unless you know that there's something better coming. No one enjoys waiting in long lines unless you know that the worth, at the, unless you know that the weight at the end of it, what you gain in the end, will be far worth the wait. And even my son knows this. There's this bedtime story that I was, we were reading from recently. And it said, and, you know, Tommy was waiting in this long line. And he interrupts and says, that's bad, right? Waiting in long line is bad, right? I was like, no, it's okay, it's okay. Anyway, okay. So, so even two-year-olds understand the frustration of waiting in long lines, right? No one enjoys the pain of labor unless you know a child will be in your arms in the end. But Peter says we can rejoice. Why? Because those who share in the sufferings of Christ will also share in the deep joys of Christ in glory. So this is the key men mental shift, paradigm shift, that as believers, people of faith, we need to go through when we view our suffering. And that is we must shift our mentality from bearing pain to sharing pain. We're not just bearing pain, we are sharing Christ's pain. We are not just bearing suffering, just grit it, just endure through it. No, we are sharing. We are allowed to be partakers or sharing in the sufferings of Christ. As believers, all of our suffering is not just bearing it. It is an opportunity to share in what Christ has gone through for us. Why is this so important to keep in mind? Why must we have this paradigm shift in seeing suffering? Because what he just promised in these verses. Because those who share in the sufferings of Christ, only those who share in that suffering will share in his joy and glory. And not only in eternity, but even now, there's a special grace and a special favor that rests upon those who suffer for the name of Christ, who suffer for doing good for the glory of his name. Look at verse 14 and 15. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Now, before you think that Peter is going crazy, right? If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Why? He says, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or of an evildoer or as a meddler. So he's saying in verse 15, we're all going to suffer. But if you suffer, don't suffer because of your sin or your stupid mistakes. Suffer because you are following Jesus. 
Because those who suffer while they follow Jesus, he says, the Spirit of God will rest upon your life in a special way. Meaning, the presence of God will anoint your life in a special way when you suffer while trusting in him. You see, there's another place in Scripture, in Deuteronomy, where it speaks of God's presence that comes upon a people in a special place. And that is when people pray. Now, you see, God's presence is everywhere. He is omnipresent. But also, we have encountered moments in our lives where we realize God is here. Now, God is everywhere. But there are special seasons, moments, places in our lives where when we enter a place or meet a person, we realize God is here. There is a presence of God that is everywhere, and there is a special, sacred, anointed presence that rests upon his people. In Deuteronomy, number one, who pray that his presence draws near his people in a special way when people pray. And then in 1 Peter, we learn that the presence of God rests upon a people of faith, who are suffering as they follow him. That in your pain, you still follow, you still trust, you still obey. There is a sacred presence of God's spirit that draws near and rests upon you in that time. You see, We can only go through suffering as God intended when we have the faith to know his good hand is still with us. Because what is really attacked when we suffer? It's not relationships. It's not circumstances. It's not our job. It's not finance. The true area of attack from the enemy when we suffer, it is our faith. The enemy's aim is is to weaken and destroy our faith in God. Because when is our faith most filled with doubts? When life is hard. When life is sunny, when life is comfortable, when everything's going our way, our faith is fine. But when life gets hard, when we doubt, is God really for me? Is God here? Where are you, God? Are you listening to my prayer? What, what, what are you doing? That's when our faith gets attacked. So that's why it's so crucial to be able to see suffering through the lens of faith. Amen? As we discussed last week, perspective is crucial in navigating through our times of suffering. Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch Christian who helped many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. She and her family hid many people in an upper attic, a hidden room, uh, when Nazi soldiers would come looking for Jews. Her story was made famous by the book The Hiding Place, which I'm sure a lot of you have read. She and her older sister, sister Betsy, uh, were put in the same prison cell. Their family eventually got caught for hiding Jews, and they were sent to a concentration camp. And, uh, but she and her sister, they were a- actually able to smuggle in uh, a Bible um, somehow. And so they would read the Bible together in secrecy, because uh, whenever the guards would come, they have to hide it again. But when they knew that they would be gone for a little bit, they'd open it up again, they'd read, they'd meditate, they'd pray, they'd worship. And this one time they were reading uh, from 1 Thessalonians of how we are to give thanks in all circumstances. And then uh, Corey Tenboom, she was the youngest child out of uh, all of her siblings. And she would complain to Betsy, like, even for these fleas, I can't give thanks to God for these fleas. And Betsy would reply, yes, Corey, even for these fleas, let's learn to give thanks. And so she begrudgingly, okay, she would scratch. Many months passed, and they were surprised that more and more uh, the guards 
time period of not checking up on them would keep increasing. And so that their private times of praying to God, of worshiping God, of singing to Him, of reading the Scripture, it kept increasing. And they were so blessed by that because God was strengthening their faith during this ordeal. Later on, um, her older sister Betsy actually died while in the concentration camp. But uh, upon release for Corrie Ten Boom, uh, she later found out that the reason why the guards did not visit as often anymore was because of the fleas. And suddenly, that verse came back of giving thanks in all circumstances. And suddenly, she was filled with thanksgiving again for her season of living with fleas. There is a sovereign hand behind our times of suffering. We cannot fully understand it now. But He is good and He is in control. So we can know that every pain will serve a greater purpose in the end. The ultimate aim of suffering is not just to bring you pain. God has a better plan than that. We may not fully see it on this side of eternity, but you can know that every season of heartache, God can use, redeem, restore for a greater purpose in your life. Every pain and inconvenience changes when we can see the eternal perspective through the lens of faith. There's a third thing that Peter encourages us to do today, and that is to remain faithful through the pain. So everyone repeat, remain faithful through the pain. 1 Peter 4.16 Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So how do we remain faithful? One of the ways that we remain faithful is to never be ashamed of the gospel or his name. Never be ashamed to tell the world that you love Jesus and that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and that Jesus is the reason why you do certain things, that Jesus is the reason why you made your career choice or your family choice. Never be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Even if they put a gun to your head or a knife to your throat, never be ashamed of Christ. You know, I saw a very disturbing video a few weeks ago about a, a Christian man in the Middle East who was surrounded by Islamic extremists. And they told him, renounce Christ and say that there is no other God but Allah or else we will shoot you now. So he renounced Christ and he declared his loyalty to Allah. So the leader of that group told all the men, put down your guns, put down your guns. He will not die by getting shot today. Then he said, instead, we will cut off his head because we still see him as an infidel. And they did. This was on YouTube. I was shot. I did not think that they would show on YouTube the actual cutting off, but they did. I was like, oh my goodness. Like, but I could not help but think, man, what was going through this guy's mind? None of us have been there, so we can't judge. But I can imagine he's thinking, all right, I've got to save my life. I've got to save my life. Maybe he's thinking about his wife, his kids. I don't know. But there is something that Jesus tells us. is that whoever tries to save his own life in this world will lose it in the end. But whoever loses his life for the gospel 
will find life in the end. And Jesus also teaches us, do not fear those who can kill the body and then do no more. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. There is only one person we need to fear in this world, and that is God. Because when you fear the Lord, you have nothing else to fear for the rest of your life. Amen? Remain faithful. Never be ashamed of his name. Verse 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So there is a judgment and a purification and a refining period that will come upon this earth. And that pruning process will begin with the people of God. Being a disciple does not exempt us from pain, persecution, and hardships. In fact, what we learn in the Bible is the exact opposite. When you follow Christ, pain will follow you. So the prosperity gospel is no true gospel. Being a disciple does not exempt us from hardships. In fact, it'll probably bring more. Even for the original disciples, only John died from old age. The others died very painful deaths. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew and Simon were also crucified. James, the younger brother of Jesus, was beaten to death with a club. Bartholomew was whipped to death. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded. Thomas was speared to death. Philip was hanged. Thaddeus was shot with arrows. Salvation is free, but discipleship is costly. It will require your whole life. Amen. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So in your suffering, trust our Savior as you entrust your souls into the hands of your creator. The death of Jesus took our death for all of eternity and the life that he now lives, he offers to all who would trust in him. And then verse 19 ends with, so as you trust him in the suffering while doing good. Meaning keep serving even though it's hard. Keep serving the Lord even when you suffer. Keep doing good. Keep loving our neighbors. Keep pursuing justice. Keep visiting orphans. Keep caring for widows. Keep providing for single moms. Keep doing good as you serve God by serving His people. Don't allow your time of suffering lead you to a self focused period of living. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the one whose eyes will never leave you. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows what he is doing even when we don't know. You cannot fully see God's purposes and plans in the midst of your pain. But you can know that God is in control. He knows what he is doing and a greater purpose will prevail in the end. You know, the Desiring God blog gave a great illustration upon this principle a couple of weeks ago that I'd like to share with you. Let's say it's Friday night and a young lady is at home uh, waiting for her longtime boyfriend to come pick her up for dinner. They didn't set a particular time for their dates, but by 6 o'clock, she was waiting in a room uh, for her evening to begin. 
and then it was 6.10, then 6.30. Finally, at 6.42, she hears a honk from her driveway. Fighting back disappointment, she storms to her boyfriend's car, plops herself into the passenger seat, and he asks, where do you want to go? She goes, I don't care, and she means it. And so he suggests, how about Panera? They have good bagels there. His dad manages the local Panera restaurant. So it's clear to her that her boyfriend isn't interested on spending a lot of money. And what could be meaningful about bagels? They pull away. They arrive at the restaurant. She dutifully selects two. He's quiet, a sure sign of his distraction and disattachments. He is so not connected to his emotions. Each slurp of her broccoli cheddar drains away her soup as her hope for a wonderful evening fades. After eating, he asks, want to go to the beach? The beach? Oh, boy. If she knew he wanted to go to the beach, she would have not have worn her favorite cardigan sweater, might get sand in it, might get water on it, what a disaster. Could anything have changed this evening? But you see, when you know the end, everything changes. Now imagine, let's rewind. Imagine the start of the same evening again, but now it's at 6 o'clock. The young lady's phone rings, and it's her friend calling her from the mall. Hello? Guess who I saw at the mall just now? It was your boyfriend. And girl, he was at the jewelry store. I saw him with a ring box. Tonight is the night when you're going to get engaged. Start planning your wedding. Everything changes. Now each passing moment builds with the anticipation in her heart. It's 6.10, then 6.30. Wow, she's thinking, he must be planning something big. At 6.42, she hears the honk from their driveway, fighting back the excitement. She tries not to run to her boyfriend's car and climbs into the passenger seat, sits down. Where do you want to go? Anywhere's fine. <laughs> and she means it. Anywhere will be perfect for what's about to happen. How about Panera? They have good bagels. Perfect. <laughs> Let's go. I'm hungry. His dad manages the Panera, so it's clear that he has something special at the restaurants. And the bagels are shaped like, oh my goodness, a ring. <laughs> they pull away and arrive at the restaurant. As she orders, she decides to order, I'll take two for as long as we both shall live. <laughs> He's quiet. A sure sign, his mind is filled with the nervous weight of this moment as she slurps her broccoli cheddar soup, checking each spoonful for a hidden ring. <laughs> Want to go to the beach after they finish their meal? Perfect! I love the beach! And I'm wearing my favorite cardigan too. The sun will set over that beach in about 30 minutes. What a perfect ending to this evening! When you know how the story ends, everything changes. So people of God, my beloved brothers and sisters, how does your story end? With a resurrection. Your perishable, broken, gaining weight body, that's changing shapes as you get older, that fallen body will likely die unless Jesus returns first. But it will be raised as an imperishable, glorious, powerful, spiritual temple of the Spirit as God intended it to be. And in your flesh, one day you will see God. How does your story end? With a reunion. You will see your loved ones who followed the Lord from generations past. 
And one day we will have a reunion before the throne of God celebrating His sovereign grace in the midst of seasons of uncertainty and of mystery. We will celebrate His faithfulness at the glorious reunion. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Your cry for your Abba Father will be answered as He sweeps you into His arms and says, Welcome home. My child, been waiting for this moment. Let me show you your eternal home. Let me show you your eternal rewards for trusting me when you could not see. How does your story end? with a wedding. For all you single people out there, there is a wedding coming. Amen, that's right. I know we got a lot more single people out there than that, but I know you guys are a quiet group, so it's okay. Your bridegroom, Jesus, will come down from the clouds with a glorious entourage of angels to bring you to the home that he has been preparing for you since his resurrection. Our small tastes of the coming kingdom in this world, glimpses of glory, will be fulfilled with a feast, a wedding feast. So believer, you too, can start planning your wedding. Knowing the ending changes everything. And we are a people who know that in the end, Jesus wins and we all go home. That truth and our trust in Jesus means we can rejoice in our sufferings because this period of pain is never the final chapter for the people of God. Good will come in the end. Reward will be lavished upon those who follow Him faithfully till the end. This is not our final chapter. Our days will not end in pain. God is taking us on a journey, teaching us to walk by faith, not by sight. God is taking us on a journey, slowly peeling our fingers off of these temporary perishing toys so that we would have open hands to receive true riches from our Father in glory. God is taking us on a journey, joining us with Christ in crucifixion so that we will be joined with Him in His resurrection. God is taking us on a journey to share in His sorrows so that we will share in true depths of joy. And that truth changes our days of suffering from simply bearing to the honor of sharing. The honor of sharing. The honor sharing the sufferings and the glories of Christ. For all who share in His sufferings will share in His glory. And my beloved in faith, in Christ, your story will end in glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are always good to us. And even when we are unfaithful, you remain faithful to us. And Father, we also want to thank you that you showed us the final chapter in the final book of your word. God, we can't wait 
for the return of Jesus. We can't wait for the great wedding banquet. And we can't wait to finally go home. But until that day, keep our eyes on you. Keep us faithful. Keep us faith-filled. Keep us loving. Keep our hearts soft and tender. May we not grow bitter. God, keep our hearts soft before you. Where there is hatred, let us extend love. God, where there is division, make us peacemakers. God, where there is pain, use us to bring healing. For the power of the cross, the power of your love that was displayed on that cross, so that we will be agents of your gospel, bringing glimpses of the glory of your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, without fault, but with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, and authority. Be exalted, O sovereign God, before all time, now, and forever. Amen.